this is our AP Chemistry Chapter 4 Lesson Video Part 1, and I'm going to cover section 4.1 and 4.2. So, we are going to talk about aqueous reactions and solution stoichiometry. So again, most of this chapter should be reviewed from Honors Chem, but there will be a couple of new things that we'll talk about. So, a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. A solution in which water is the dissolving medium is called an aqueous solution. So most of the solutions we'll work with in this class are going to be aqueous, but not all of them. You can have another solvent like ethanol or something like that. The substance present in the greatest quantity is called the solvent in aqueous solutions. That's water. Water is considered the universal solvent because of its ability to dissolve many substances. The other dissolved substances are called the solutes. So the important thing to remember is a solvent dissolves a solute. A substance whose aqueous solutions contain ions is called an electrolyte because it will allow electric current to flow through it. An example is salt. When it's aqueous, you have salt water, it will conduct electricity. So anything that will conduct electricity is called an electrolyte. A substance that does not form ions in solutions is called a non-electrolyte. An example is sucrose or sugar. When ionic compounds dissolve in water, the ions separate and are surrounded by water molecules. Okay, so remember we talked about how that works. The oxygen side of water, because it's more electronegative, will face towards a positive ion. Whereas the hydrogen sides of water, because they are partially positive, will be attracted to a negative ion. Once ions have separated, they can move and conduct electricity. In the crystalline form, they cannot move or conduct electricity. So solid salt, the sodium and chloride ions, they're trapped in those fixed locations and they're just vibrating. So solid salt cannot conduct electricity. But once you dissolve salt in water because the sodium and chloride ions break apart and now they're free floating around in the water, now you can conduct electricity. You just have to have charges that can move in order to conduct electricity. The solvation process helps stabilize the ions in solution and prevents the cations and anions from recombining. So that's why the sodium and chloride ions don't end up reforming in the water because the water molecules have surrounded them. That's called the solvation process. So it's like the water molecules are blocking the sodium and chloride ions from each other. Water molecules are polar and have a partial positive and partial negative side. And so this is what I was just talking about. The more electronegative oxygen atoms are attracted to the positive ions and the less electronegative hydrogen atoms are attracted to the negative ions. So for example, if they gave me this picture, I know it's probably hard for y'all to see the white hydrogens um, on the water molecules because it's also a white background, but if I see that all the hydrogens are facing these two ions, what can I determine about the ion? Well, since I know the hydrogen is partially positive, it should be attracted to a negative ion. So I could determine that both of these ions are negative. When a molecular compound dissolves in water, the solution usually consists of intact molecules, which would be neutral, dispersed throughout the system. Consequently, most molecular compounds are non-electrolytes. A few examples, uh, sorry, a few exceptions include strong acids like HCl. So, for example, like I said, if you have an ionic compound, the water molecules will surround the negative ions, they'll surround the positive ions, those ions can now move so it can conduct electricity. Most molecular compounds, you will have neutral molecules floating around. Neutral doesn't help conduct electricity. We need charges that can move. Um, so since they're neutral, it will not conduct electricity. However, a few exceptions include strong acids. Okay, we'll talk a little bit in this chapter about strong acids and strong bases and how they sometimes kind of break the rules of science. Okay, so even though HCl is considered molecular, it's a strong acid, so it will break into H positive ions and Cl negative chloride ions. Whoop. Strong electrolytes are those solutes that exist in solution completely or near completely as ions. So strong electrolytes almost fully break apart in solution. Weak electrolytes are those solutes that exist in solution mostly in the form of molecules with only a small fraction that form ions. Okay, so a strong electrolyte, pretty much all of it's going to break apart and you'll get good electric current. 
A weak electrolyte, so most of them will stay together, but a few will break apart into ions, so this would be like your weak acids, weak bases. Um, so it will conduct electricity, but not as well. So if it was attached to a light bulb, a strong electrolyte might fully light the light bulb, whereas a weak electrolyte will only dimly lit it. And then a non-electrolyte, which is your molecular compounds, they remain as neutral molecules, they don't break into ions, and so there will be no electric current. Chemical equilibrium is the state of balance in which the relative numbers of each type of ion or molecule in a reaction are constant over time. Equilibrium is represented by a double arrow for the yield sign. This shows that the reaction is occurring in both directions. Okay, so we'll do lots of chapters on equilibrium later, but whenever you see a double arrow like this, that's just saying that the reaction is occurring in both directions. Remember that soluble ionic compounds are strong electrolytes. We consider ionic compounds as those composed of metals and nonmetals, such as NaCl, FeSO4, and AlNO33, or compounds containing ammonium ions, such as NH4Br and NH42CO3. Okay, so if it's a metal and a nonmetal, or it has that ammonium ion in it, those are our strong electrolytes, our ionic compounds. Also, don't forget, though, that strong acids and bases will also fully break up. We'll talk about those again in a minute. So the diagram below represents an aqueous solution of one of the following compounds, MgCl2, KCl, or K2SO4. Which solution does the drawing best represent? Well, I can see that I have positive ions with a positive one charge and negative ions with a negative two charge. So the best thing to do first would be look at the charges. So magnesium is positive two, chloride's negative one. So it should not be that one. K is positive one, chloride is negative one. So it shouldn't be that one. K is positive one, sulfate, SO4, is negative two. So it would make the most sense that this would be K2, SO4 because of the charges that are on the ions. So that one hopefully was super easy. All right, so it says, if you were to draw diagrams like the previous one, representing aqueous solutions of each of the following ionic compounds, how many anions would you show if the diagram contains six cations? So to do this problem, all I need to do is look at my relative amounts of each of my ions. Okay, so here I can see that for every one nickel, I'm going to get one sulfate. So remember, you have to keep yourself from thinking that this is four sulfates. This is one sulfate. So if I have six nickels, I would need six sulfate ions. And that's all we have to do. All right, so here I can see that for every one calcium, I need two nitrates. Okay, so if I have six calciums, then I need 12 nitrates. Just like that, you're just looking at the ratio of the two ions. So for my next one, I can see for every three sodiums, I need one phosphate. Remember, PO4 is one polyatomic ion, it's not four. So for every three sodiums, I only need one phosphate. So if I have six sodiums, then I only need two phosphate ions. Just like that. All right, so then for our bottom one, I can see that for every two aluminum, I need three sulfate. Okay, so sometimes for some of you, when they both have a subscript, it's a little hard for you to kind of like figure out what's happening. So you can always set it up as a ratio. Okay, so I know that I have six aluminum cations. Okay, because that's what it tells me in the question. We're starting with six cations. And I can see that for every two aluminum, so remember, follow that golden rule, two aluminum go on bottom, I need three sulfates. All right, so six times three is, of course, 18. Divided by two is nine. So I need nine sulfates, just like that. Okay, so when they both have a subscript, if you're getting a little confused, you can just set it up like a mole ratio almost. All right, so hopefully that wasn't too bad. Don't forget to be trying these on your own now. Okay, watching me do them isn't going to help you. you got to be trying stuff on your own. All right, so section 
point to is a precipitate reaction section. So reactions that result in the formation of an insoluble product are called precipitate reactions. A precipitate is an insoluble solid formed by a reaction in a solution. So for precipitates, you need to know your solubility rules. Okay, you have a copy of your solubility rules. If you are not in my class, you can easily look up a copy of solubility rules. If you are in my class and you lost your copy, you can find it on my website. All right, so when you have liquids or a reaction that's occurring in a liquid and you form a solid, that solid is called a precipitate. The solid itself has to be insoluble. If, the, if what you think is a solid is soluble, it's not going to be a solid. It will remain aqueous. So the solubility of a substance at a given temperature is the amount of substance that can be dissolved in a given quantity of solvent at a given temperature. Most important solubility rules. Alkali metal ions and ammonium ions are soluble in water. So if you struggle with memorizing the solubility rules, this is the most important one. So your alkali metals, so your group one metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, that group, and ammonium ions are soluble in water. Summer bridge students, please rotate group. And another important one is nitrate ions are soluble. Like if you remember those two, then you're probably good, but I would just make sure to know all of them. Okay, so the important thing to see is that solubility of a solid tends to increase as temperature increases. Now, not all of them do. There's always exceptions to the rule, um, but in general, they tend to increase as temperature increases. So it says classify the following ionic compounds as soluble or insoluble in water. So if you don't already have your solubility rules out or you don't have them in your mind, um, go ahead and get them out so that we can look at these together. Okay, so first thing, is, whoops, let me get, oh, I don't have any map on this one. I don't know why I'm trying to get my thing out. All right, so it says sodium carbonate. So alkali metals are soluble. So once you know that part of a substance is soluble, you don't have to look at the other part. Okay, so it doesn't matter what it says about carbonates, although if you look at your solubility rules, it will tell you carbonates tend to be insoluble. Well, alkali metals are soluble, so this one would be soluble, which means it would not be a precipitate, it would remain a weak. All right, next we have lead to sulfate. So lead is not on our solubility rules, but sulfate is. It says sulfates tend to be soluble, however it has some exceptions, and lead is one of those exceptions. So instead of being soluble, it would be insoluble, and so this would be a precipitate. So if you had a reaction where you formed lead to sulfate, you would have a precipitate. All right, so you just gotta be able to use those solubility rules. All right, so maybe pause it, try these on your own, and then let's look at them together. All right, so it says cobalt to hydroxide. Well, cobalt is not on your solubility rules, but hydroxide is. It says hydroxide is insoluble. So cobalt 2 hydroxide would be insoluble, which means it would be a precipitate, so it would form a solid. Now, the couple of exceptions to the hydroxide rule are your strong bases, which again, we'll talk about those later in this chapter. All right, next one's barium nitrate. So barium's not on your solubility rules, but nitrate was that other really important one I told you about. Nitrates are soluble. So that means that the whole thing will be soluble, it would not be a precipitate, it would be aqueous. And then last one is ammonium phosphate. So again, ammonium is soluble. It doesn't matter what it says about phosphate. Okay, so it's gonna tell you that phosphates tend to be insoluble, it doesn't matter. Because ammonium is soluble, so the whole thing is soluble. And so it would be aqueous, it would not be a precipitate. Okay, and these are important for you to know because when we get to net ionic equations in a minute, you've got to know what is a solid and what is aqueous in order to know what stays in the reaction and what leaves the reaction as a spectator ion. All right, so um, exchange reactions. This is just another word for double displacement reaction. So in AP chemistry, you'll notice they use lots of different terms to mean the same thing. So don't let those throw you off, okay? You know what a double displacement reaction is. Like if you saw this, I would expect you to think, oh, that's double displacement. 
So it doesn't matter if in a question they call it an exchange reaction. It's the same thing. So reactions in which positive ions and negative ions appear to exchange partners conform to the following generic equation. So you can see, like I say in honors, it's like wife swap. We're swapping our positive ions. Such reactions are called exchange reactions or, like we called it in honors chem, double displacement reactions, or it can even be called metathesis reactions. So again, don't let which term they might call it on the AP exam throw you off. You know how they work. You swap your two positive ions. Okay, and a lot of these tend to be uh, precipitate reactions. So steps for writing double displacement reactions. You write the formula for the reactants. Don't forget to balance charges. Write the formula for the products by switching the cations of the two reactants. Don't forget to balance charges. Then balance the whole equation. Include states of matter when needed. So especially if they're asking about precipitate or they want you to write net ionic, you'll want to put those states of matter. So is it solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous? So, sample exercise 4.3. It says predict the identity of the precipitate that forms when solutions of barium chloride and potassium sulfate are mixed. So first of all, they were nice enough to give us the starting reactant formula. So I didn't have to write those myself. So we have BaCl2 aqueous. Now you might think, wait a minute, how did you know that was aqueous? Well, it says solutions of them are mixed. A solution is a homogeneous mixture, and in this case, it's aqueous. All right, so we have barium chloride and potassium sulfate. So let's figure out what we're going to make here so that we can predict what the precipitate's going to be. Well, I'm going to swap my two positives. Okay, so since some of y'all aren't great with charges, that's why I always tell you, go ahead and label your charges. Even though it told me what the formulas are, if you label your charges, you can just bring them over. So barium's positive 2, chloride's negative, K's positive, sulfate's negative 2. So now I'm going to bond Ba with SO4. So I'll put my Ba is positive 2 with my SO4, which is negative 2. So I don't need to do anything to balance charges. Now, K is going to be with Cl, but remember, the 2 for the K and the 2 for the Cl came from the fact that they were bonded to something with a positive 2 or a negative 2 charge. They aren't with those ions anymore, so I'm just going to bring over a K and a Cl. And also, don't forget that your positive one is always listed first. So, K and Cl, their charge is already balanced, so I don't need any subscripts for this. And so then my next step is, of course, to balance my reaction. So I come in here, I have one BA, one BA, two CLs, one CL, so I'll put a two here. So see, this is how I fix the fact that I don't have two K and two CL anymore. I have two K, now I have two K, SO4, SO4. Okay, so this is my reaction. So then it says, predict and identify the precipitate. So I just need to go through and decide which of these would be a precipitate. Well, SO4 is normally soluble, but it has some exceptions, and BA is one of those exceptions. So it would be solid. Potassium is an alkali metal. It is in, uh, sorry, this is, uh, I might have just said this was soluble instead of solid. This is insoluble, so it's solid. K is an alkali metal. Those are soluble, so it's going to be aqueous. All right, so what would be my precipitate? It would be BASO4. That would be my precipitate. All right, then it says, write the balanced chemical equation for the reaction. Well, I mean, that's what I just did. So I actually already answered B. Okay? And so that's all you have to do. You just got to make sure you know your solubility rules. And like I said, the two most important are that alkali metals and ammonium ions are soluble and nitrate ions are soluble. Can't remember the rest of them. Just try to remember those. All right, so maybe pause it. You try these on your own, and then we'll look at them together. So it says, what compound precipitates when solutions of Fe2SO43 and LiOH are mixed? Write the balanced equation, and then will a precipitate form if these two are mixed? Rotate group at this time, please. Rotate group. All right, so because I go ahead and write the balanced equation to figure out if a precipitate's formed or not, I'm just going to go ahead and start with B. Okay, so I start with solutions of each. So I have Fe2SO43 aqueous and LiOH aqueous. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and 
go ahead and put my charges. So Fe can have multiple charges, but since SO4 is negative 2, Fe has to be positive 3, because I have negative 6, positive 6. Li is positive, OH is negative. I'm going to swap my two positives. So now Fe is going to bond with OH. But remember, it only has the 2 here because it was with sulfate. It's not with sulfate anymore, so I'm just going to bring over one of them. So we have Fe positive 3, OH negative. So I need to have three hydroxides. Don't forget to put hydroxide in parentheses. It doesn't already have a subscript, but it's still a polyatomic ion. So if you need more than one, you have to put it in parentheses. And now lithium is going to bond with sulfate. But remember, sulfate only has this three because it was with iron. It's not with iron anymore. So lithium's positive, sulfate's negative two, so I need two lithium. All right, so it says balance, so let me go ahead and balance it. I'll get rid of my arrow. All right, so I have two iron, so here I need two iron. I have three sulfates. Here I only have one, so I need three sulfates. I have one lithium. Here I have six lithium. I have six hydroxide and six hydroxide. All right, so last step, of course, is it solid or aqueous? So we know hydroxides tend to be insoluble, so this would be solid. We know sulfates tend to be soluble, but they have some exceptions, but it doesn't matter because one of our most important ones is alkali metals are soluble. So this one would be aqueous. So now I can go back to part A and it says what compound precipitates, and it would be my FeOH3. That would be my precipitate. All right, so part C is a little bit tricky. Okay, it says, will a precipitate form when solutions of barium nitrate and potassium hydroxide are mixed? So let's write our reaction to see what's going to happen. So I have barium nitrate, and it's aqueous, and potassium hydroxide, and it is also aqueous. Ooh, sorry, my aqueous is getting kind of sloppy here. All right, so barium is positive 2, nitrate's negative 1. Potassium's positive, hydroxide's negative one. I am going to swap my two positives. So barium will now be with hydroxide. So Ba positive two, OH negative. So remember, I need two hydroxides, so I have to put it in parentheses. Now K is gonna be with nitrate. But remember, nitrate only has the two because it was with barium. It's not with barium anymore. So K positive, NO3 negative, so those already cancel, so we don't need to cross any charges. All right, so let's go through a balance. I know it didn't ask us to on this one, but you always need to practice balancing. All right, so we have one barium, one barium, two nitrates, and one nitrate, so I need a two. One K, two K, so I need a two. Two hydroxides and two hydroxides. All right, so then last thing is, it says will a precipitate form. Well, we know that those alkali metals are not going to form a precipitate. They are soluble, so it is going to be aqueous. Now, this is where you got to remember your strong acids, strong bases. It tells you that hydroxides are insoluble, which would normally make this a solid. However, we are going to discuss that barium hydroxide is one of the strong bases. A strong acid and strong base are defined by the fact that they fully ionize or break apart. So because this is a strong base, it will actually be aqueous, not solid. All right, and we'll talk about what the strong acids and bases are. All right, so this is actually not going to have a precipitate. No precipitate. Okay, because both of our products end up being aqueous, although like I said, you would think that one's going to be a solid. It's not actually a solid because it's a strong base. Okay, your strong bases are just your hydroxide ions with alkali metals or with the heavy alkaline earth metals. So we're talking about Ca, Sr, Ba. Those make up your uh, strong bases. All right, so a molecular equation is an equation showing the complete chemical formulas of the reactants and products without showing dissociated ions. So you just saw me write a couple of those in our previous examples. I just wrote the reactants and the products. I didn't leave any ions out. 
A complete ionic equation is an equation that shows all soluble strong electrolytes as ions. So if I wanted to, anything aqueous I could actually split up and write as the ions. And then anything solid, liquid, gas, or our weak acids and bases, we would write those in their molecular form. We don't use complete ionic equations a lot. We more focus on net ionic equations. So ions that appear in identical forms on both sides of the yield sign are called spectator ions because they do not actually react. They're just floating around in the beaker or the glass. A net ionic equation is an equation in which the spectator ions have been removed. So if this is my complete ionic equation, I can see PB was aqueous, but now it's solid. So it did something. NO3 was aqueous, it's still aqueous. It didn't do anything. So that's a spectator. It's just floating around. K is aqueous, it's still aqueous. It didn't do anything. I was aqueous, but now it's solid, so it did something. So if I cut out my spectators, what I'm left with is my lead ion, my iodide ion, making my lead to iodide precipitate, just like that. Okay, so like I said, net ionic equations only become tricky when you have a weak acid or base involved because it will be called aqueous, but we treat it as if it's a solid because it's not going to dissociate into very many ions. But otherwise, make sure you pay attention to solids, liquids, and gases in these. So in a net ionic equation, the number of atoms and the charges are conserved in the reaction. If every ion in a complete ionic equation is a spectator, then no reaction occurs. So if what you start with are two aqueous reactants and what you end with are two aqueous products, then nothing actually happened. There was no precipitate, everything's just floating around and is aqueous. And so like I said, we say no reaction occurs. So how do we write net ionic equations? Well, hopefully you remember this from honors because pretty much everything we've done so far in chapter four, you know from honors. So first, you write your balanced equation. You can write the complete ionic equation, which shows strong electrolytes written as ions, and then identify or cancel the spectator ions. But I just like to look at my reaction and determine what would be spectators without having to split everything up. But if you do need to go through this step, of course, you're more than welcome to. So let's look at this one together, and then I'll let you try one. So it says, write the net ionic equation for the precipitation reaction that occurs when solutions of calcium chloride and sodium carbonate are mixed. Okay, so I have calcium chloride. So calcium Ca is positive 2, chloride Cl negative 1, so I need two of them, and it is aqueous because it said it's a solution. Sodium carbonate. Sodium is Na positive, carbonate is CO3 negative 2, so I need two sodium, and it is also aqueous. Okay, so see y'all, if you're not able to write formulas quickly like that, you are not going to finish the AP exam. Okay, you have got to get where you see sodium carbonate and you think, oh, Na positive, CO3 negative 2, I need to put a 2 with Na. you got to get fast with these. All right, so I know I'm going to swap my two positives. I can see this is just going to be double displacement. So I have CA positive 2, CO3 negative 2. So I don't need any extra subscripts because my charge is already balanced. And then remember, Na and Co only have the subscripts because they were bonded to ions where they needed a subscript. They aren't bonded to those ions anymore. So we have Na positive, Cl negative, so I don't need any more subscripts on them. All right, so next step is to balance. So I have one Ca, one Ca, two Cl's, one Cl, so I need a two. Two Na's, two Na's, CO3, CO3. All right, so I need to determine, using my solubility rules, what's solid and what's aqueous. So it tells me carbonates tend to be insoluble. So it's a solid. Remember what I told you, one of the most important rules. Alkali metals are soluble, so this would be aqueous. So y'all, I can look at this and see. Calcium was aqueous. Now it's solid. It did something. Chloride was aqueous. It is still aqueous, so chloride didn't do anything, so I'm going to exit out. Sodium was aqueous. It is still aqueous, so sodium didn't do anything. And then carbonate was aqueous, and now it's solid. And so see, that's how you can write the net ionic without having to write the complete ionic in between. Now, of course, you always can write the complete 
the ionic in between if we want. That just wastes a lot of time. Oops, I don't need my charges over here. All right, and don't forget, once you separate an ion from its other ion, you have to put the charge. Now, when something's together, you don't need the charges for that. All right, and so that's my net ionic equation. So I removed my spectators. So like I said, you just have to be careful when there's um, weak acids and weak bases. Those are the ones that get a little tricky. All right, so you try the next one, and I'll assume you've done that. So it says, write the net ionic equation for the precipitation reaction that occurs when aqueous solutions of silver 1 nitrate and potassium phosphate are mixed. So I have silver 1 nitrate. So silver is Ag. The Roman numeral means positive 1 charge. Nitrate is NO3, negative 1. It is aqueous. And potassium phosphate. Potassium is K, positive 1. Phosphate is PO4, negative 3. So I need 3 potassiums. And it is also aqueous. All right, so I know this is double displacement, so I'm going to swap my positives. So silver will now be with phosphate. So Ag positive, PO4 negative 3, I need 3 silver. And now K is going to be with NO3. Now remember, K only has the 3 because it was with phosphate. It's not with phosphate anymore. So we have K positive, NO3 negative. So I, those charges already canceled, so we're good to go there. All right, so... Let's balance next. So I have one Ag, three Ag, so I need a three. I have three nitrates. Here I just have one nitrate, so I need a three. I have three Ks, three Ks, and PO4, PO4. So we're balanced. All right, so next I need to determine who's the precipitate. At this time, all oh Tomber Bridge students, please return to the commons area. The all Tomber Bridge students to the commons area. Probably shouldn't have come to record it. Oh, well, it's happening. Alright, so it tells me phosphates are insoluble, which means this will be my solid. And then I told you, two most important rules. Alkali metals and ammonium are soluble. Nitrates are soluble, so this is going to be aqueous. Alright, so I can see silver was aqueous, now it's solid. It did something. Nitrates aqueous is still aqueous, so nitrate didn't do anything. Potassium was aqueous, it's still aqueous, so potassium didn't do anything. And then phosphate was aqueous, but now it's solid. All right, so I bring, don't forget your coefficients that you may have added. So I bring down my silver ions, three silver ions, they're aqueous. I bring down my one phosphate ion, which is also aqueous. And I make my silver one phosphate, which is solid. Okay, so hopefully that wasn't too bad. Like I said, it really should have just been a review of things you already know from honors chem.